Well, good evening. I hope you all had a blessed and restful Sunday afternoon. It's always a blessing to be back together. Let's open in a word of prayer here tonight. Father, thank you for this privilege to gather together this evening to study your word and to dive into it. I ask that you bless this time. Give us all wisdom and knowledge that we may know you and know your word increasingly more and that we may live in obedience to it. Just please guide and direct us as we go into this next week. Help us in every situation to analyze it through the lens of your word and to act in accordance with your holy will, bringing you glory. Bless me now to preach your word and to preach it faithfully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, over the past few sermons, we have certainly seen the absolute importance of coming to the Scripture and studying it intently and also doing it, living in obedience to it. That is what we have seen here as a dominant theme in the, la in the last portion of the first chapter of the book of James. And Lord willing, we're going to finish this first chapter here this evening. So let's dive in, starting in verse 23. James chapter 1, verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world world. And so this morning we saw the importance of hearing the word of God and doing it in verses 21 and 22. And now we see here where James is telling us about the man who doesn't just merely hear the word, but looks intently into the word of God, the perfect law of liberty. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. So we are talking about a person here to start with who hears the word yet again, but this hearing doesn't lead to action. They don't actually implement what they hear. They are like a man looking at his natural face intently in a mirror. And so James is saying that whenever we look into God's word, that it is like we are looking into a physical mirror, like we are examining our physical appearance in an actual mirror. And that is what looking into God's word is like. It shows us the truth of our appearance, spiritually speaking. Even the unorthodox and liberal theologian Karl Barth once made an accurate statement. He said, I have read many books, but the Bible reads me. And that is the sort of thing that we are talking about here in James. That the Bible, it shows us who we really are. That whenever we read the Word of God, we are seeing 100% truth. And we see where we fall short of that truth in terms of our lives. It is as though this man here, James mentions that he is intently looking. And it is as though he is straining to see what is truly there. And so this is the man who yet again hears the word, but doesn't actually do it. But if you look at verse 24, what we see is that this man looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And so this man, it is as though he is literally coming to the mirror and then he is walking away, not remembering anything about what he has seen whenever he looks intently into this mirror. Think about it for a second. Imagine a man with long hair who gets up in the morning, hasn't taken a shower yet. The hair is all over the place. Maybe he has a beard that's scraggly. And he goes to the mirror to look at his appearance. 
and he looks in that mirror and he decides that he is just going to walk away and not do anything and he forgets what he looks like. That is like the person who looks at the word of God, who hears the truth of scripture, peering intently into it, but doesn't actually do it. That is what they are like. They are like that man who looks into the mirror and pays no attention whatsoever. These people have seen the truth of God, but they don't actually care to do it. They quickly forget about their spiritual condition. They quickly move on with their life, not seeking to apply the word of God. These Christians are not truly passionate about the Lord. These individuals, they're professing Christians only. They're not actually true believers. True Christians seek to love the Lord and to come into his word, to peer deeply into it, to look intently to it, and to go apply it. And we see this at the first part of verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. And so we see a transition here. We're not talking about the man who merely looks at the word, who merely hears the word. We're talking about this man now who is really deeply looking into the law, the law of liberty, and they are seeking to live in obedience to it. This man is looking into the mirror, and he is going to be obedient to what he actually sees. Now, the law here, of course, it is a reference to the Old Testament, but it would be inclusive of all of Scripture, both Old and New Testament. Every single command from Genesis through Revelation is inspired by God and perfect. And we must seek to study it and to know it and to apply it. And of course, whenever we say that every single command is perfect, we do understand that when we're looking at the Old Testament law, we do understand that such things as the sacrificial system have been fulfilled in Christ, and that's why we're not making sacrifices any longer as New Testament believers. But we have to understand that the Bible is authoritative in its totality from the Old Testament through the New Testament. And so we are given the very law of God, his word to go into and to study. And this is the perfect law, but it is also the law of liberty as we see it referenced here in this text. Contrary to popular opinion, the law of God in every single command from his word is a blessing. And we have to keep that fact in our memory. Actually, it is interesting because only 55% Uh, professing American evangelicals would strongly affirm that the Bible actually has the authority to tell us what to do in our lives. And so that means that 45% of professing evangelicals are either somewhat unsure about the Bible's authority or totally disagree that the Bible has any authority over them whatsoever. And so we are living in a time Time where even professing Christians ultimately hate the word of God and do not view the word of God as liberty. They do not view it as a joy to actually come to the commands of Scripture and live in submission to them. And that is not really surprising if you think about it. We live in a society that teaches what is known as freedom of choice. Now, freedom of choice is actually a very good thing if we define what we mean by that term very carefully. Contrary, again, to what many people think, whenever the Puritans initially came to North America to settle in the colonies, they did not believe that freedom of choice meant the right to do whatever anyone pleases whatsoever. They meant that freedom of choice, that true freedom is the right to choose what is moral, the right to choose that which accords with virtue. Rod Dreher in his fascinating little book, Live Not By Lies, actually makes that point very well. But Christians have never affirmed, they have never affirmed that people should be free to do whatever they desire in their lives. For example, we do not believe that people should be free to murder one another. We do not believe that that human beings should be free to torture other human beings. However, we do believe that people should be free to choose what church they believe 
best teaches the word of God and to go to that church of their choice. We do believe that people should have the freedom to speak, even if we disagree with their opinions. However, our society today teaches that freedom of choice is literally the freedom to choose whatever you want, and no one should stand in the way of that, period. Just like in the case of abortion, if you think about it, it's a really good example of this concept. Those individuals who are pro-abortion, who want to see abortion advanced in our society continually, they do not say that they believe in the slaughter of innocent babies. That's not how they phrase their position, is it? They say that they are for a woman's right to choose. They say they are pro-choice. Now, I certainly believe in a woman's or in a man's right to choose. They are free to choose who they marry. They are free to decide many things in their life, but they are not free to choose to take innocent life. No human being is free to murder another human being. That is not choice. That is evil and wickedness. That is murder. But you see the whole concept here of these two definitions of freedom, these two very different definitions of freedom, one going back to our history with the Puritans who initially came over here, going back ultimately to the Word of God, and another definition of freedom that has its roots in secular modern society. Modern day folks say that freedom is the right to choose whatever makes us happy. And no one should stand in the way of that, even if what makes us happy is taking innocent life. The Puritans who came here said freedom is the right to choose that which is virtuous, that which is moral. And this concept of choosing whatever makes you happy, which we see in secular society, has in fact creeped into the church in many different ways. Francis Schaeffer once accurately said that if you look at the culture, roughly seven years from now, Many people in the church will be believing the exact same thing. And we see that sort of a thing in this area. How many times have you heard people say that Jesus just wants them to be happy? Not righteous, not holy, just happy. That is the same sort of concept. Of course, Jesus does give us eternal joy, but we are called to be faithful. We know that we will endure suffering and persecution as his followers. We are promised a life, an eternal life of joy with him, but we know that we must count the cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ. We are never promised a life of earthly happiness or earthly earthly prosperity in the Bible. And so what is the difference between these two polar opposite understandings of freedom and a freedom of choice? Well, ultimately, it comes down to understanding the law of liberty, the perfect law that we see referenced here in the book of James. That word liberty, both the Greek word and the English word, is closely tied to the concept of freedom. In fact, if you read the New American Standard, this part of the verse is translated as the law of freedom. You see, the Puritans, they understood many things very well. They didn't get everything right whenever they came over here, but they did get a lot correct. And one of the things that they got absolutely right on target is this. They understood that true freedom is grounded in the word of God. True freedom is found in living in obedience to the commands of God in his word. True freedom ultimately is the ability to do what God has commanded of us as his people. And so whenever we talk about freedom, whenever we talk about liberty, whenever we talk about choice, we have to see that true eternal joy comes not from living however we please, but instead living in obedience to the very law of God himself. The first part of Psalms chapter 1 verse 2 says that the righteous man delights in the law of the Lord. Psalms 119 verse 14 says, In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. Verse 16 of, ch of chapter 119 of Psalms says, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. 
Verse 35 says, Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. And verse 47, For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Do you see a theme here? These are but, but a few portions of the Psalms, a few verses, only a handful that we could choose out of multiple that talk about the blessing and the joy and the delight of living in accordance to the commands of Scripture. This is freeing the law of God, the word of God, living according to it, is true freedom. It is the law of liberty. It is our delight and joy as Christians. True freedom does not come from us deciding what we want to do according to our own human standards, even though many in our culture would have us believe that very fact. True freedom comes from knowing God's word and obeying it. Now, to be clear, whenever we talk about freedom, and we talk about it especially in regards to society and our nation's founding, we, we are not saying, and we have to be clear on this, we are not saying that we should go around forcing people to become Christians because that is true freedom. We are not saying that we should force people to come to church. That's not what we're saying here, and we need to be clear on that fact. Whether what I am saying is that we as Christians need to see the freedom that is found in living in accordance to God's word. We need to, we need to understand that we should bring the scripture to bear on every single area of our lives, and we desire to see God's standards and God's justice ruling and reigning both in our lives, in the church, and in society as a whole, including the very laws itself. We desire to see true justice reigning, and God is the one who says what is true. And so we want to see our lives in their entirety in submission to the scriptures. And so we look into this perfect law, we look into this law of liberty, and we don't see it as a chain around our neck. And instead, we see it as the way in which we are able to live in obedience to God, and that is our true joy and delight, and that is in itself true freedom. The commands of God are not burdensome. And so we look into this mirror, and we look at our own lives, and we see where we fall short of God's word, and we seek to live in obedience to it. And we practice his word, we practice his commands for the glory of Christ. Not so that we can gain salvation, but because of the great salvation we have been given in the Lord and our hearts have been changed to want to desire to live in obedience to his word. And so verse 25 of James chapter 1 says we are to look into this law, but notice the next phrase. The text says, and perseveres. And so we are not just to look at the law, look at the word of God for a moment and then forget about it. We're not to practice it for a moment and then stop. We are to persevere, to continue on, to press forward in living faithfully according to God's standards, to endure in our obedience to it. And the verse continues to expound on this. It says, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. The hearer, the man who just looks at the word of God, but doesn't actually put it into practice, they just forget about it. They just move on. They move forward. But the doer, the person who actually obeys the commands, they remember and they apply what they have learned. They understand the word of God and they actually seek to build their lives upon it. Each day of their life that dawns, they continue. They continue to remember God's word and they continue to strive to be obedient to it. And this person is blessed for it. The last part of verse 25 says he will be blessed in his doing. And so obeying the word and putting it into practice is actually a blessing. It is a blessing for us as Christians. This man understands that he has been freed from sin, that he has been freed from sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been given salvation in him. And he therefore is blessed with this opportunity to come to the word and to live in obedience to it. 
But what does it actually look like for someone to live in obedience as they go throughout their life? What are the marks of someone who is living in adherence to the word of God? Well, look at verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And so this is part of the contrast between true and false religion that we have seen here in the book of James and that we're going to continue to see as a dominant theme as we proceed in this book. The obedient Christian seeks to bridle the tongue. They seek to control the tongue. They seek to have everything that they say be in submission to the Lord. As we covered back in verse 19, they are slow to speak. It is the same sort of a concept. They are careful with what they say. But the person who does not control the tongue is demonstrating the worthlessness of their religion. They are showing the fact that they are not truly trying to honor God. They are deceived in their heart in this way. Many times they may have the outward appearances of religion, but does not, they do not possess the true heart transformed by Christ. But we see what true religion looks like in verse 27. Verse 27, which says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so by making this statement here, this short summary of true religion, James is not saying that this is all of the duties included in true religion or true saving faith. We know that there are many more, such as loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and honoring the Lord Jesus Christ by proclaiming his gospel. But he is giving a short summary, a short statement regarding what true religion does look like, that these are some of the duties of true religion. And so whenever he uses these two words, pure and undefiled, as John MacArthur says, he is pointing to the most spotless kind of religious faith, that which is measured by compassionate love. And it truly is compassionate to visit the orphans and widows and to care for them in their affliction, as this verse says. These were a portion of individuals who were very needy, especially in the early church. We know that actually Paul spent a good deal of 1 Timothy chapter 5 telling Timothy about his duties in taking care of the widows, defining exactly who a widow is and how Timothy was to take care of them in his pastoral ministry, guiding the church in that way. And of course, you'll remember that in Acts chapter 5, I believe it is, that men were set apart for taking care of the tables, taking care of the widows and the orphans was a part of their duty. And so James here says that it is a mark of true religion to visit such people. Why is that? It is because it is these people, by visiting, these people who are practicing true religion, they are showing hearts full of compassion. They are showing love for other individuals. They are showing that they are really trying to live according to God's word by helping these people in their affliction. And that they are truly seeking to glorify and to honor the Lord as they go through their lives. And notice that they are specifically here to visit orphans and widows, as the text says, in their affliction. And so not only are they visiting these people, but they're visiting them when they are in their most needy. They are visiting them whenever they are in the greatest need of help and cannot repay. And so such treatment for others is demonstrating a heart of true religion. Certainly James is not saying that every single person who visits a widow or an orphan is automatically saved, but he is saying that this is a heart, this is the type of a person that is demonstrating that they do have a true profession of faith, that they are really seeking to love others and to care for others and to serve them. But James adds one more thing here, and he says, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The evil, sinful world ultimately has no part in the believer's life. 
We, we are called to be the light as Christians. We are not called to be in the darkness, to have ourselves spotted by the darkness and the sinful ways of this world. We are to stay free from wickedness. We are to stay free from evil and the focus on honoring the Lord Jesus. We, as the church, are supposed to influence the world for the Lord Jesus Christ by advancing his kingdom. And we are not supposed to be influenced by the evil ways of the world ourselves. We are to influence them through the proclamation of the gospel, through the heralding of the entire word of God, and we are not supposed to be influenced by the false ideas of the world. Therefore, we must not allow ourselves to be stained by sin. Instead, we must remain pure and focused upon the word of God. And so this true religion here, it is manifesting itself in caring for the widows and the orphans and maintaining free from the world in the, in the area that we are not falling prey to the sinful temptations. We are not falling prey to the false worldview and teachings of this world. This is true biblical Christianity. This is what true faith looks like. And I might add on this concept of being unstained from the world, as I said earlier, Francis Schaeffer rightly said that many evangelicals will believe seven years from now what is popular in the culture, and that is being stained by the world. And that is not what we want to be in our lives. That is not what we are called to be as the church. We are called to remain rooted and grounded in the truth of Scripture, to be free from the ways of this world, that we are to be of this world, in this world, in the sense that we walk amongst the people of the world, that we seek to share the gospel with them, but we are not to be of the world in the sense that we are participating in the sinful ways that we are having our garments stained by them. That is the charge given to us as Christians, that we are to seek to proclaim the word of God to this lost world that desperately needs salvation, but we ourselves are not to be stained by their sinful ways. That is what it means to be a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so since we are wrapping up here on this first chapter, I want to open up and allow perhaps for anyone that may have questions on the first chapter of the book of James. It seemed like this would be a good time to do so. If you have any questions you would like to bring up about this first chapter, feel free to go ahead and I'll see if I can come up maybe with an answer or two. And if nobody has any questions, then we'll close the message in a word of prayer real quick.